it. Your new companion appears much more formidable than your uncle. Should I be worried? Huh. You haven't been introduced. Jill, Clive has told me much about you. All lies, I'm sure. Your Stolas said that Dalamil has a bandit problem. Indeed. Although, you're a little late. They left with our food and gill days ago. Any idea where they went? The desert's a big place. Your guess is as good as mine. But the fact is, I have more immediate concerns. What did you say to me? What did you say? Ah, as if by magic. Let's just say we've yet to reach a consensus about how to solve Dalimil's little problem. And at this rate, it won't be the actions of the bandits which prove to be our undoing. It will be our own. Now, I've tried reasoning with the dissenting parties, but even the desert hare has limits. Perhaps we could talk to them. What makes you think they'll listen to us? What makes you think they won't? She makes a fair point, Sid. And you won't have wasted much of your precious time if you fail. They're just across the courtyard. Suppose we just follow the shouting. talk like that if it had been your men whose throats were slit. Blood for blood, it's the only way. We hire mercenaries and have them mount the bandits' heads on our walls as a lesson to the rest. And what happens when those mercenaries are slaughtered like your men? Are you going to hire more? We're better off using that coin to buy food and supplies. If we hire mercenaries, the only thing we're buying is the bandits' ire. And you cannot fill empty bellies with that. Do you hear me? But what happens when they come back? Maybe it'll be your throat that's slit. That's enough. Both of you. Any more of this and I'll throw you out myself. Come back when you're ready to talk like adults. Victor. What's he doing here? Sid. And Lady Jill. What brings you here? I was about to ask you the same thing. Costness is in chaos. And the markets have all but ceased to operate. The Briar's Kiss here in Dalamil is the only place I can reliably obtain supplies. I was here to do just that, when Master Lubor told me of his troubles. He thought I might be able to talk some sense into these fools. But if you're here, I suppose his patience must be waning. Who are those people? Those were the thorns in Lubor's side. And the reason this place might be headed the same way as Kostnis. It's these accursed skies. The darkness is enough to drive a man to madness. Or an entire city, for that matter. We're still working on the skies. But in the meantime, perhaps we can find a solution to Dalamil's problems. I hope so. For all our sakes. So, you see my predicament? What I saw was a room full of people who were angry and afraid. And with good reason by the sound of it. But if left to smolder, that anger and fear could set the entire town alight. My thoughts exactly. Ugh, what to do? Both sides wish to protect their homes and livelihoods, if only they could agree on how. But as long as they are divided, we are vulnerable. And if there's one thing bandits like, it's an easy target. What would Sid the Outlaw suggest? 
Well, if it were my namesake... He'd let them choose for themselves, and be on hand to pick up the pieces when it all went wrong. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. <sighs> a recipe for disaster is precisely what it is. But perhaps that realization would be enough to make them question the ingredients. While it's plain neither Conrad nor Natalie will countenance the other's proposal, it may still be possible to make them doubt their own. Before presenting them with a third option. And that would be... To pool our resources and save the city ourselves. Why fight each other? When all that fear and anger can be directed at the bandits. It appears we have a plan of action. Victor, pay Conrad a visit. See if you can't convince him of his folly. I'll speak with Natalie. As you wish. Hmm. Your faces are not well known in this town. That may prove useful. Don't worry. Victor and I will do most of the talking. You need only play along. Play along? What he means to say is yes. Picture it, Conrad. Ah, here she is. The Lady of the Spear herself. Conrad, may I introduce you to Jane, commander of the Red Wings, the oldest mercenary guild in the Free Cities. A pleasure, my lady. The pleasure is all mine. As I told you, I summoned the commander here from Canberra to inquire about a contract. Victor says you told him no. That there aren't any men left to hire. Is that true? True as the crystals cracked. Nobles came and claimed every last one worth his salt. And not just from us Red Wings. You know of the seven high houses. There must be two score swords assigned each one. Granted, we have a few boys left. If it's boys you're looking for. Well, Conrad, are you saying that Dalamul's finest cannot defend this town better than a gaggle of unblooded striplings? That a band of beardless youths could better avenge the deaths of your brave men than you yourselves? Absolutely not. We'll show those bastards who they're dealing with. I can't believe that actually worked. Conrad's not what you call the brightest candle in the crypt. And there's a reason why I had you do the talking and not Sid. Well played, my lady. Then let us band together and show these brutes that Dalimil is not to be trifled with. If I had my pickaxe, I would I mean, it may still be possible to buy something. Ah, here he is now. Natalie, allow me to introduce Lord Underhill of Randalar's prestigious League of Merchants. Uh, Lord Underhill. At your service. Underhill. I was just telling the good lady of our conversation, my lord. ...and how you were lamenting the state of the capital stores. Lubor says that not only are the granaries almost empty... ...but that war and the blight mean this season's harvest won't be enough to fill them for winter. Indeed, certainly that is the case. The nobles in the capital are buying up the city's stocks of barley and... ...wine... ...driving the prices higher than most commoners can afford. It is only a matter of time before the peasants revolt. <clears throat> it is worse than I thought. If what Lord Underhill says is true, 
I fear we have little hope of supplementing our stores, meager though they regrettably are. And while I applaud your endeavors to dissuade our more bellicose citizens from seeking vengeance, I sense Conrad is not wrong in his assessment of the bandit's likely return. Which means that now, more than ever, we will need to secure what little we still have. Food, weapons, herbs, everything. If our humble town is to endure not only this hardship, but those that are certain to follow, we must stand united. All right. If it will help to protect my home, I'll do it. But you needn't have gone through this charade. Thank you, Clive. Your performance was nothing if not workmanlike. She saw right through it. I didn't say it was good. Merely that it produced the desired effect. Now, my scouts should be returning shortly. Meet me back at the Briar's Kiss, and we shall see what we face. I'm not convinced our roles in this ruse were entirely necessary. <laughs> I don't know. Conrad seemed quite taken with you. Mummy, I'm scared. Oh, I'm ruined. Good news, Sid. Both Conrad and Natalie have somewhat gracefully accepted their new roles. With time, they may even learn to. Time no longer appears to be the luxury it was before lunch. I take it your scouts found the bandits. Technically, it would be the bandits who found my scouts. It appears they march for Dalamil as we speak. All of them. You're not serious. They don't just want food, they want the whole damn town. I have a favor to ask. I'm told the bandits march in two groups, one from the south and one from the desert, in a move, doubtless, intended to stretch our already gossamer-thin defenses. Very well. Jill and I will meet those from the desert. But what of the rest? The rest, my friend, the city shall fight. Together. Mistakes, I concede, are high. But if this does not unite Dalamil, nothing will. That is a lot of faith to put into those who had their hands around each other's throats but a moment ago. Then it will be for us to see that their hands are kept occupied. And I do mean us. I thought you might say that. We'll hold them off for as long as we can. And we will do the same. <laughs> the women folk have come to bug us. I'll take that one. He's all yours. <laughs> They mean to overwhelm us.
The townspeople. Could they have held out? I don't hear any fighting. What do you think? That we should hurry. Natalie, I owe you an apology. You did well out there. The inn would have been lost had you not held the line. Without you, there would have been no line to hold. You saved us, Conrad. You saved Alamil. We all saved Alamil. Conrad seems to have had a change of heart. I'd say they both have. I take it from your presence that our visitors from the desert won't be joining us either. Pity. The plan worked, Sid. Granted, it only took an army of bloodthirsty bandits at our gate. Come now, Victor. Why quibble over the details? We are united, and that is all that matters. As for you, Sid, you fight considerably better than you act. I'll take that as a compliment. Our friends seem to have things under control. For now, at least. Let's go and put Otto's mind at rest. weighing you down. You're rubbing me blind, you know. So, will it be? Turn up. Had our small our friends thanking you for your timely intervention. 
How is it you always manage to arrive at just the right moment? Luck, I suppose. Any word on the rest of the realm? Hmm, let's see. Storm's still crying out for Mother Crystals. The nations are still in chaos. And the skies are still the color of a kick in the kidneys two days on. So... Right. Clive, we knew this was gonna happen. Well, not the bleeding skies part. But you take my point. Now's not the time to second guess yourself. Now's the time to visit the infirmary. Taya says your brother's awake. Thank you, Otto. So it was not Sylvester, but Olivier who served as Ultima's puppet. And when Dion learned of this, he sought to slay the fiend. <sighs> Only for his father to take the spear that would have freed him. Enough to drive a man to madness. Small wonder he hasn't stirred. I would be afraid to wake. Had I but reached out to him sooner, warned him of the threat Ultima posed. But now, both an empire and her prince lie broken. Joshua, what do you know of Ultima? Very little, I'm afraid, despite my best efforts. Eighteen years ago, as I lay buried beneath the rubble of Phoenix Gate, it was not death who came for me, but another. And it was while in my rescuer's care I first heard of Ultima. I've been chasing his shadow ever since. Ultima is driven by some deep, dark purpose, and for whatever reason, it would seem you are crucial to his designs. He will stop at nothing to have you. Even if that means toppling an empire. But why me? What possible use could I be to such a creature? That is one of many answers that have eluded me. Yet, I am certain of this. It is not mere chance. You were chosen for a reason. All dominants carry within them the might of an icon. Nigh limitless power that is at once acutely limited. I wield fire and only fire. And I only ice. Eight wardens for eight elements. But you, Clive. You are different. You're special. Your abilities begin with the flames of Ifrit, but they do not end there. The fact Ifrit can even exist goes against everything we thought we knew of dominance. Perhaps Ultima has been waiting for one such as you, whose potential is truly limitless. I've encountered that thing several times now. If it or he, as you say, needs me, why hasn't he claimed me as he did the boy? Were I to hazard a guess, I'd say the two of you are somehow incompatible. His mind not properly attuned to your body. His mind? Mind, awareness, spirit, call it what you wish. But I believe Ultima to be an embodiment of the concept. This is why I struggle and fail to contain him here inside me. I'm sorry. Inside you? With every setting sun, I feel my strength wane. And though the Phoenix's flames mend the prison I have made for Ultima, they do so at a cost. We must find a means to bring an end to him before I meet my own. What were you thinking? It was that or let him take Clive. And I've always had a soft spot for my brother. But that doesn't mean you should sacrifice yourself to save me. <laughs>
Joshua. <coughs> Clive, it's Gav. <coughs> There's an army of Akashic at the gates of Canver. <coughs> Well, what's the short of it? Uh, it's all tired, told you. The capital of the free cities is under siege by an army of monstrosities. The city guard are doing their best to stem the tide, but numbers ain't on their side. What of Lord Byron and Mid? Were they able to escape? No, but they're all right for now. They're hiding with Gav at midship. We have to get them out of there. Mm. And we shall. Otto, prepare a stolas. Tell Gav to stay exactly where he is. Understood. Vivian, what's the swiftest route to the free cities? <laughs> that sounds like a question for the map. Look here. This road, through Tabor, should provide the least trouble. Good. What a coincidence. Tabor is exactly where I'm bound. Joshua. Bed is where you should be bound. You don't think I told him the exact same thing? Were Taya not such a talented healer, I would surely have been inclined to agree. But thanks to her ministrations, I feel I may safely rejoin my attendant, who was to wait for me in Tabor if we became separate. All right, we travel together. Clive! If he stays close to me, he'll be fine. Thank you, brother. I'll look after him.